repositories. Open source is self-explanatory in, in its title, pretty much. People kind of understand what it is. It means that various coders get to share in this this code and the source code, and they, they get to innovate, and they, they all get to participate and use each other's work, right? Right. Um, but blockchain is confusing for a lot of yeah, people. Yeah. Could you explain that? Sure. I mean, bl blo blockchain itself is, is almost a misnomer. So we're confused. Okay. Things are confusing at, at, at every level, right? So <laughs> we can we should start with the idea of a distributed ledger, which is basically like a distributed Excel spreadsheet or database. It's just a store of information, which is not stored just in one place, but there's copies of it in a lot of different places. Every time my copy of it is updated, everyone else's copy of it has, has, has got to be updated. And then, then there's various bells and whistles like sharding where, you know, it can be broken in many pieces and each piece is stored many places or something. So that's a distributed ledger and that's just distributed computing. Now, what what makes it more interesting is when you layer decentralized control onto that. So imagine you have this distributed Excel spreadsheet or distributed database. There's copies of it stored in a thousand places. But to update it, you need like 500 of those thousand people who own the copies to vote, yeah, let's do that update, right? Mm. So then, then you have a distributed store of data and you have like a democratic voting mechanism to determine when all those copies can get, can get updated together, right? So then, then what you have is a data storage and update mechanism that's controlled in a democratic way by the group of participants participants rather than by any one central controller. And that, that can have all sorts of advantages. I mean, for one thing, it means that, you know, there's no one controller who can go rogue and screw with all the data without telling anyone. It also means there's no one who some lunatic can go hold a gun to their head and shoot them for, for what data updates were made. Because, you know, it's controlled democratically by, by everybody, right? It has all ramifications in terms of, you know, legal defensibility. And I mean, you could have some people in Iran, some in China, some in the US, and, and updates to this whole distributed data store are made by democratic decision of all the participants. And where cryptography comes in is when I vote, I don't have to say, yeah, this is Ben Gertzel voting for this update to be accepted or not. It's just ID number 1357264. Right. And then encryption is used to make sure that, you know, it's, it's the same guy voting every time that, that, that it, it claims to be without needing like your, your passport number or something, right? What's ironic about it is it's probably one of the best ways ever conceived to actually vote in this country. Yeah. Sure, I mean, it would it be kind of ironic. Right? There's a lot of applications for it. That, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's that, that's right. So that, there's, so that, that I mean that's the core mechanism. Though where the blockchain comes from is like a data structure where to store the data in this distributed database, it's stored in in a chain of blocks where each block contains data. The thing is. Not every so-called blockchain system even uses a chain of blocks now. Like some use a, a tree or a graph of blocks or something. Is it so, a bad term? Or is there a better I mean, term? It's it's an all right term. Is it, it like AI? Like just one of those terms we're stuck with? Yeah, yeah. It's one of, it's yeah. one of those terms we're stuck with, even though it's not quite technically, not quite technically accurate. And I mean anymore. I mean because I don't know another buzzword for it, right? What, right? what it is is a it's a distributed ledger with encryption and decentralized control. Yeah. And blockchain is the buzzword that's come about for that. Now what? What got me interested in blockchain really is this decentralized control aspect. So my, my, my wife, who I've been with for 10 years now, she dug up recently something I'd forgotten, which is a web page I'd made in 1995, Whoa. like a long time ago, where I'd said, hey, I'm going to run for president on the decentralization platform, right? Which I'd completely forgotten that, that crazy <laughs> idea. I, I, I was very young then. I had no idea what an annoying job being president would be, right? But, but that, so that the idea of decentralized control seemed very important to me back then, which is well before Bitcoin was invented, because I could see, you know, a global brain is evolving on the planet, involving humans, computers, communication devices. And we don't want this global brain to be controlled by, by a small elite. We want the global brain to be controlled in a, in a decentralized way. So right. so that that's really the, the beauty of this uh, blockchain infrastructure. And what, what got me interested in the practical technologies of blockchain was really when Ethereum came out and you had the notion of a smart contract, which- What's Ethereum? Ethereum, yeah. So what is that? Well, so the first blockchain technology was Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a well-known cryptocurrency now. Ethereum is another cryptocurrency, which is okay. the number two cryptocurrency right now. That's how out of the loop I am. Did you know about it? You did. H however, Ethereum came along with a really nice software framework. So it's not just like a digital money like Bitcoin is, but Ethereum has a programming language called Solidity that came with it, mm. and this programming language lets you write what are called smart contracts. And again, that's sort of a misnomer because a smart contract doesn't have to be either smart or a contract, right? Oh, but, but it was a cool name, right? Right. What does really, it mean then? If it's really not a, a smart, smart contract, it's, contract. It, it's like a, a programmable transaction. Okay. So you, you can program a legal contract or you can program a, a financial transaction. So a, a smart contract, it's a, it's a persistent piece of software that embodies like a secure encrypted transaction between, between multiple parties. So pr pretty much like anything on, on the back end of a, a 
bank's website or a transaction between two companies online, a purchasing relationship between you and the website online. This could all be scripted in, in a smart contract in, in a secure way, and then it would be automated in a simple and standard way. So the vision that Vitalik Buterin, who was the main creator behind Ethereum, had is to basically make the internet into a giant computing mechanism, rather than mostly like an information storage and, and, and retrieval mechanism, make the internet into a giant computer by making a really simple programming language for scripting transactions among different computers and different parties on the internet, where you have encryption and you have democratic decision making and distributed storage of information like programmed into this, this world computer, right? And that, mm -hmm. that was a really cool idea. And the Ethereum blockchain and Solidity programming language made it really easy to do that. So it made it really easy to program like distributed, secure transaction and, and computing systems. Systems on, on the internet. So I saw this, I thought, wow, like now we finally have the tool set that's needed to implement some How of this. How popular is this? It's very popular. Yeah. I mean, I mean, basically almost every ICO that was done in the last couple of years was done on the Ethereum blockchain. What's an ICO? Initial coin offering. Oh, okay. So for Bitcoins. For, Not or, Bitcoin. No, I'm sorry. Cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, so yeah. So they've used this technology yeah, for yeah. offerings. So, right. So what happened in the last couple of years is a bunch of people realized you could use this Ethereum programming framework to create a new cryptocurrency, right. like a new artificial money, and then you could try to get people to use your new artificial money for certain types of- How many of, of artificial trends. coins? Thousands, are, thousands now. Now. maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. And but the, I mean, how, the how most many... popular is Bitcoin, right? Or the, Bitcoin, the is, Bitcoin is by far the most popular. The most Ethereum used. is number two, and there's a bunch of others. I mean- how, With comparison, like uh, how much bigger is Bitcoin than Ethereum? Hmm, I don't know, five factor, five of, factor of three to five. So. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, maybe just a factor of two. Now it's actually last year Ethereum almost took over Bitcoin. When Bitcoin started crashing. Yeah, yeah. Now Ethereum is back down. It might be half or a third of. Bitcoin. Does that worry you? The the fluctuating value of these things. Well, to my to my mind, creating artificial monies is one tiny bit of the potential of what you could do with the whole blockchain mm -hmm. tool set. It it happened to become popular initially, right? Because it's where the money is, right? I mean, right, it, is I money, mean yeah. it is it is money, and that's interesting to people. Yes. But on, on, on the other hand, what it's really about is making a world computer. It's about scripting with a simple programming language all sorts of transactions between people, companies, whatever, all sorts of exchanges of, of, of information. So, I mean, it's about decentralized voting mechanisms. It's about AIs being able to send data and processing for each other and, and pay each other for their transactions. So, I mean, there's, it's about automating supply chains and, and, and shipping and e-commerce. So the, there's an, in, 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 in essence, you know, just like computers and the internet started with a certain small set of applications and then pervaded almost everything, right? Yeah. It's the same way with blockchain technology. Like it started with digital money, but the core technology is, is going to pervade almost everything because there's almost no domain of human pursuit that couldn't use like security through cryptography, some sort of, you know, participatory decision making, and then distributed storage of information, right? So, and these things are also valuable for AI, which is how I got into it in the first place. I mean, if you're making a very, very powerful AI, that is going to, you know, gradually, through the practical value it delivers, you will grow up to be more and more and more intelligent. I mean, th this AI should be able to engage a large party of people and AIs in participatory decision making. The AI should be able to store information, you know, in a widely distributed way. And, and the AI certainly should be able to use, you know, security and encryption to validate who are the parties in, in, involved in its operation. And I mean, these are the key things behind, behind blockchain technology. So, I mean, the fact, the fact that blockchain began with artificial currencies, to me, is a detail of history, just like the fact the fact that the internet began as like a nuclear early warning system, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it did. It's good for that, but it's as it happens, it's also even better for a lot of other things.